What a story. I love that phrase, I was counting on it. The challenge this morning is he's still counting on it. If you and I will go tell everyone. Open your Bibles with me to the book of John, chapter 4, as we close this series. And as you're turning there, I'll mention I have on my patriotic tie, which I bought in Canada. <laughs> True story. And if you look on the tag, it was made in Korea. A true testament to capitalism. Uh, United States tie bought in Canada, made in Korea. But I love what this weekend, I, I, get, I get emotional about this, this weekend. I'm, I'm grateful for all those who've uh, served our nation and served us so we can be here today. And very, very thankful for those of you who have served and made it home. Uh, and those who put on the uniform and never had the privilege of taking it off. And I've been to several countries in my traveling. And uh, if there's one nearby, I make an effort to ask uh, if there is a uh, military, a United States cemetery there for our soldiers. And it's something to go to Arlington. I've been to Arlington and walked through those, uh, those lines and aisles. But I've also been to some other countries and to know that those people uh, gave their lives in that country fighting on our behalf and never made it back. So I'm grateful for, for our nation and grateful for those who serve us so well and those of you who've served and continue to serve uh, in our military. And uh, as we look at this text here today, I I was just looking over, and I see Miss Barbara McCleskey back there. She is one of our old American. Can you stand up for a second? She is, I think, and I may be getting this wrong. You get to talk about these ladies' age, you get in trouble. I think she's 88 years old. She is 90. Well, there's not many who correct you on that side, all right? I'm 90 years old. <laughs> 29 years, and... Uh, I, I, was, I was reflecting, she and her husband, Mr. Tom McCleskey, door greeters, when I first came to Midway Church 25 years ago, thank you for your love and support all these years. I know you have. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed getting beaten by Mr. Tom. Uh, sure did. Great to see you today. You're certainly welcome. You're welcome, sweetheart. Uh, glad y'all are here today. Isn't, isn't, isn't God good? I loved what we sang a little earlier, and, uh, and it's just good. Uh, soap and hope. My goodness. Never thought so much about soap in all my life, how good it can be. Soap and hope. And that fits in right with the message today because I'm preaching this morning from John 4, wrapping up this series, this teaching, with this thought. When Jesus shows up, his love knows no limits. His love knows no limits. This story, this encounter demonstrates the depth of God's love. His saving love knows no limits. It transcends all barriers, race, gender, ethnicity, religious tradition, and yes, even sinful behaviors. His love knows no limits. I want that to sink in for a second. That God's saving love transcends all those barriers. The reason I want that to sink in is because we're in church today and it's people of faith who in every generation have struggled to embrace that concept. The Pharisees struggled to embrace that concept. <laughs> that Jesus' love knew no limits that it transcended ethnicity, it transcended race, it transcended even sinful behaviors. And every generation since Jesus, it's people of faith who have struggled to embrace that. Once we receive the gospel, if we're not careful, we, we begin to feel a sense of self-righteousness which alienates us from different categories of this world, of society, and we withdraw from the very people whom God has sent us into the world to reach and to represent him too. 
And, and I, that's been a theme of Midway Church. We've worked hard to, to not forget that and to constantly embrace this truth. But it's not without a price, not without a cost, not without effort. And I, I want to keep reminding you, I want to keep reminding us of 25 years together, I want to keep reminding all of us that God sent us into the world to break down those barriers, break down those walls, walk through those barriers, and constantly try to connect to people who oftentimes are very much different than we us ourselves are. And that's hard. This story of the woman at the well, she is often called. The woman at the well, that's her name <laughs> through history. The woman at the well. We have no name. She's just the woman at the well. Some would call her the Samaritan woman, the half-breed, the Samaritan. I'll talk a little more of what a Samaritan was in a moment. But the Samaritan was a racially mixed person of her day, which at this point had been looked at with disdain for over 700 years of history. Something that had taken place 700 years before when the Assyrians conquered and overcame the Jewish people and took them away captive and then sent Assyrians into that region to settle it, to ultimately marry and intermarry with people racially different than them and religiously different than them. And it created challenges for them for centuries to come and put a mark on them that in Jesus' day was still not taken down. They still were not accepted by mainstream society. And, and this woman felt that in this story, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Story is told by 42 verses. I have a tendency when I preach to read the text, to read the story, to read the verses, but I'm not going to read the 42 verses. And can everyone say amen? But I, I want to tell you the story in summary, and then I want to talk about some different principles from the story that I, I think should affect all of us. Jesus is passing through Samaria, not by accident, but by intentionality. Verse 2 of this chapter, and I would encourage you to read this chapter this week, these 42 verses especially of this week in your personal time and get a bigger grasp. In verse 2, it says he began to pass through from Galilee. And then in verse 4, it says, and he had to travel through Samaria. If you think literally, logistically, that's not a true statement. But he's not speaking logistically. He's speaking about being on mission for God, his father. We know that because in verse 34... When his disciples brought him food, they said, you need to eat. It's time to eat. He'd send them to town to get some meat. They brought it all back to eat. And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That's my food, to do the will of him who sent me. He's on mission. We know it logistically wasn't necessary for him to go to, through Samaria because if you go to Jerusalem, we, we do this intentionally when we go on our trips to Jerusalem, but they're major gateways. Samaria was centered in the mountains. It's up near Megiddo. We refer to the Valley of Megiddo. Megiddo, it's a massive valley that stretches across the northern end of Israel. And on the hilltop near Megiddo was Samaria. There was actually a town of Samaria, but there was a region of Samaria. And the region of Samaria is encompasses several cities, but the town of Samaria was the actual capital city of what's called the northern kingdom of Israel. And it was a, a gateway. You, you passed through the roadway between mountains, and it's where all the Samaritans gathered and lived, and they had their own place of worship because they were outcasts in their society. Jesus could have gone the normal route for all Jewish people to go, which was down by Jericho out of Jerusalem and go to the Jordan River and then take the road up the valley of the Jordan River. It's a beautiful valley. I love going down there and visiting Jericho, hottest place on earth, about 110 or 15 degrees last time I was there. And um, it's just north of the Dead Sea. And you follow all the way up and you go to 
Galilee, which is Jesus' home working area, and you can go to your left and go over to Nazareth, and you can bypass this entire thing here. You can bypass this entire area called Samaria, and Jews bypassed it regularly. Why? Because there were people there who were outcasts. There were people they didn't want to be associated with. There were people there in which they frowned upon, and their entire culture frowned upon. But it says Jesus had to go there. I like that. It wasn't simply a necessity, but God had him on a mission. God the Father had him on a mission. So keep that in mind. And then he meets there in the city of Sychar, which is not on the main road, but off the beaten path. Again, a detour. And he goes to a well known as Jacob's Well. I've been to Jacob's Well. There's no dispute that that's the original Jacob's Well that goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Hand dug through pure stone, solid stone and rock. Commonplace people to gather and get water. And Jesus finds himself at that well by himself without a bucket. <laughs> it's over 100 feet deep and it's, he's without a bucket. And a woman comes to the well and he says, woman, would you give me a drink of water? She comes to draw water. Would you give me a drink of water? A discussion begins to happen, and she, very aware of her racially distanced culture, she said, why do you, a Jewish man, ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? How dare you? And he said, woman, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink, and I'd give you a drink you'd never thirst again. And she said, do you think you're better than Jacob, the man who dug this well? Our father... Jacob, so you really think you're better than he? You can give me water, I never thirst again. I never have to draw water again. He said, if you really knew, you'd ask me. <laughs> she said, what do you know? He said, matter of fact, go ask your husband. Bring your husband here. Well, I don't have a husband. Yeah, I know. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. She said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. His disciples showed up with the food in which he'd sent them for earlier. About the time this lady's leaving, and they said, you need to eat something. And my, he says, my food's to do the will of him who sent me. I must be about my father's business. She ran to town and said, come see a man who's told me everything I ever did. I believe I have found the Messiah. The end of the chapter says that many Samaritans came and listened to him. They asked him to stay for two more days in this place where Jews are not supposed to be. They didn't want to be around him. He didn't want to be around them. But they said, please stay with us. He stayed two more days and taught them. And many of them believed on him as their Lord and Savior. I love that story. It's a great story. That's, that's what's in those 42 verses. Now I had to make a decision which direction to take because I, I've heard it preached so many different ways and all of them right. There's so many things here to address and deal with. Can't deal with them all. But I want to deal with something that's very, very practical for you and me. I want to deal with three key challenges that I believe we're challenged with in this story. If you're a follower of Jesus, here's some challenges we find for ourselves. Number one, write this down. We are challenged to step into the story of strangers. We're challenged to do that, to step into the story of strangers. How many of you like stepping into the story of strangers? Any weird person out there like that? We don't usually like stepping into the story of strangers. We don't like meeting new people. If you're like me, you go to a room with new people, you feel intimidated, you feel sometimes aggravated. They've got their own little group. They're already carrying on conversation. I was at a, uh, a competition hunt last Friday night up near Chatsworth, Georgia. I walked in. I'm the only person in the room that I knew. <laughs> I knew not another living soul there. I walked in. They're all talking. They're outside talking. And they're, they've got their dogs. They're leaned up against their trucks. They're enjoying life. It's a Friday night. I walk in as a stranger. And you may not see me this way, but I began, I felt myself intimidated in that group. I didn't know any of them. I walked in the room. Not a person looked at me twice. They looked up one time to notice they didn't know me. And they went back to their regular conversations with one another. Uh, they're no different than what most of us do in our own natural, very familiar 
settings. But Jesus challenges us to step into the lives of strangers, into their story, into their conversation. What was his motivation for doing so and what was our, what's our motivation for doing so? His motivation is found in verse 34. I've referred to it. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In other, in other words, he's saying to us, our life is about so much more than our challenges and our problems and our ambitions. Our life's more than that. Now, most of us live in a life where my life's about me and my challenges, my problems, and my ambitions. But he reminds us here that it's not. It's about more than our challenges and our goals and ambitions. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he reminds us, he challenges us that our life is about a broader purpose, a bigger purpose, about something that God has done and is doing in our life and through our life in the lives of others. As a matter of fact, we even find his method, his methodology is found in verse 7. It simply says here, a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. That's his methodology. You say, what's so special about that? Nothing. That's what makes it special. It's that it was just the natural thing happening for that day. That's, that's what's special about it. We're always looking for something really a sign. We're looking for something special, but it's the mundane in which Jesus uses to step into this lady's world. He's at a well. He's thirsty. She has a bucket. She's come to draw water. He says, would you give me a drink of water? That's his entrance stepping into her world. About two weeks ago, I found myself at an automobile automobile mechanic shop, getting some work done on my truck. I sat inside the office, little waiting area for about 15 minutes. There was only one other person in that room. He was caught up into a magazine, reading some kind of magazine that was there in the, in the office. He never said anything, looked up, he nodded, I nodded, not a conversation, not a word was spoken. He was intrigued in his story and I was just hanging out in the room then finally word came from across the counter to this other gentleman I'm going to need to keep your vehicle overnight until tomorrow there's a part that I can't get I, I'm going to have to keep it until tomorrow and it's going to cost more than what you want to spend he just got information on two fronts that we don't like to get it's going to cost more and take longer I could tell he's in a dilemma he's a little frustrated he was a man of few words. He didn't say anything in response for a minute. And he finally walked up to the counter and he's just sort of standing there for a moment. And something said to me, do you ever have that? <laughs> you, know, you know what something is, don't you? When those kind of moments, usually it's God trying to do something inside. He's not a something, it's a someone. And he's speaking on the inside and challenging us to do something that we really prefer not to do. Are y'all awake this morning? Yeah, listen, okay. Help me out here. I'm not talking to myself. And God inside of me, the Spirit of God literally says to me, offer him a ride home. I don't want to offer him a ride home. I got things to do. My wife's at home. She's already, I've got a certain amount of time. We got somewhere to go. We're getting ready to go out of town. She's at home packing. I got to go back and pick her up and get on the road. And now, he, now the Lord is saying on the inside, offer him a ride home. I don't know where he lives. He might live in Villarica or Douglasville. I'm down in Carrollton, and I'm going back to Rootville. But I said, uh, do you need a ride home? And he stopped and turned and just completely froze for a moment. He said, man, w would you do that? Yeah, I'm such a good guy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I, man, my, my wife works over an hour away, and I was just standing here trying to ponder and think if she even could get off of work if I called her to come and get me. Nobody else in the room to offer, but so, yeah, I offered. We got in the truck, started home. I said, where do you live? I didn't know where he lived. He said, Rootville. 
<laughs> Matter of fact, he lives only probably three, maybe four miles from my house. So on the way home, we just chatted, chit-chat stuff. What do you do? What's your story? Share with me about some nerve damage in his neck from riding bulls. Share me about permanent nerve damage that now he doesn't get to do for a living, what he used to do for a living. Major change and shift has happened in his life. He spent weeks at home recovering after surgeries, wondering if he'd be able to walk and function the way he once did. Struggled. Wife working, providing for the family at certain times of that when he felt like he just physically he couldn't. Working now but not doing what he would love to do and working at nights, working at evenings. His wife's working daytime. We pulled into his driveway. He said, We're, I'm, I'm here. We pulled off the road. Nice little home there. Acreage and farm life, which I'm very familiar with and love. And he's, he's finishing telling me a little bit of his story. I've got my radio on. And all of a sudden, I came on the radio. <laughs> Literally, I came on the radio. I turned it up. I'd never told him I'm a pastor. He, we were in the conversation. I, he'd asked me about my, my dog box in the back of my truck. So I'm sharing. I'm talking to him about coon hunting. And he said, man, I'd love for you to take me and my son. He's 10 years old, coon hunting sometimes. I'd love to. And we're, we're working on that, working that out. And then I came on the radio. And uh, I said, hey, hey, that's me on the radio. And I, I turned it up. And, and he just froze. And the message was on Loneliness, feeling alone. He just talked about through those surges and recovery times, just feeling alone. And he froze. He listened to every word. And it finishes by, by saying, as Jesus cried on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The challenge was if Jesus felt lonely on the cross and loneliness found Jesus on the cross, I can assure you it's going to find all of us at some point in life. And he stopped when it was all over. And he said, wow, that hits close to home. And he said, I don't think it was an accident that you were in the room and offered to take me home today. Uh, I gave him my number. We exchanged numbers. And I said, call me when you have a night off. I'd love to take you and your boy coon hunting. It's been a couple of weeks. I hadn't heard anything. And yesterday I got a text. Hey, Todd. Uh, just want to say thank you again for giving me a ride home. Really would like to go coon hunt and take my little boy. Maybe we could go next week. And, and could I take you to lunch next week? And thank you again. He said, I just had, listen, this is the exact phrase. I had something inside of me telling me to say a prayer for you today. We all feel that something. You know, you, huh? Do we not? God's, all, all my point is this. God's at work. And we're having lunch this week, by the way. Um, God's at work in our life. And he, he, he puts people in our life, strangers. Strangers. They're breathing people, but they have, they have a story. Everything about their story is not perfect. Everything about my story is not perfect. I share with him about... This year's been a tough year for me, too. I know what it's like to feel alone. I know what it's like to feel frustrated. I know what it's like to feel like you're hitting a wall. This year, following a pandemic, I've had a stroke that I didn't ask for. I've had two kidney surgeries I didn't ask for. I've had recuperation. My body doesn't heal like it used to heal. It's been hard for me to move forward. I'm, at that point, was still living in pain and still 
forcing myself to move forward in spite of how I felt and to get up every day and do what I do in spite of, not because of, how I felt. That's the story of all of us at some point. (laughs) No one's exempt from those things. And Jesus here challenges us, and I think we're all challenged every day to look for that stranger, that detour that God may have us on. And I I, I say this in jest, but it it could be a a frustrating flat tire. (laughs) It could be a knocking in the engine. It could be a sickening feeling in the stomach that forces you to the drugstore or to the emergency room. It it could be a a phone call in somebody else's life. It could be an absolute physical or mental or emotional failure or shutdown in your being that sidetracks you and detours you not for a moment or for a day but possibly for weeks. And we sometimes look at those things and say, why me? Or, and we, we wrestle and deal with our own struggle through that journey. But in reality, oftentimes God puts us into these moments because my life is not about me and my challenges and my heartaches and my disappointments and my, how I feel today and about how I've been abused or how I've been frustrated or how life isn't good to me or even all of my ambitions and goals about how successful I am or how fruitful I am or how much money I have. Fact is, all those things may exist, but God has us in this world as his followers to step over into the life of strangers because I have news for you. I don't care how healthy you are. You're going to die someday. And it's going to all be over in this world. And all that's going to matter is the world to come. And that affects, is effective for not only me and my life, but I have a life to live in which I can help influence other people and help them pre- get prepared for eternity so we're challenged in this story to step into the life of strangers number two we're challenged in this story to step across personal barriers personal barriers we all have barriers as to why we don't I mean one of the reasons we don't because we don't like strangers we're afraid of strangers. We're scared of strangers. And it's not just strangers, even friends. We don't, sometimes we don't like friends. Sometimes we don't like us. But this person that he stepped into the life of, number one, is a woman. He said, what's the problem with that? Maybe not in our culture, but in that day, for a man to be speaking publicly with a woman was culturally taboo. It just wasn't supposed to happen. And here this lady is And this man speaking, and we know this is true because when the disciples showed up, they were stunned. When they come back with food for lunch, they're stunned to find Jesus standing out in public at this well speaking to a woman. It's in the text. Read the story. They can't believe it. What's he doing speaking to this woman in public? She's a woman, a barrier. Number two, not only was she a woman, but she's a Samaritan. I've already mentioned a little about the Samaritans, but here's this person that in her culture, because of her race, her mixed race, and all that went with that, it wasn't just skin tone or it wasn't just heritage, but it was also religion because the Jews had kept as much of their religion as they could from 700 years captivity earlier. And the Assyrians brought much of their religion and faith also into that culture. It had been blended and a temple had been built at Mount Gerizim, which was there in Samaria. And they worshiped on Mount Gerizim. Why? Because of their Gentile background now. They've been mixed with people who were not Jewish. They were not allowed into the inner courts of the temple in Jerusalem. So therefore, they just developed their own way of worshiping and carrying out the Jewish faith in, on Mount Gerasim in Samaria. And that's what the conversation is. You Jews, you Jews say we can't worship God unless we go to Jerusalem. And we say we worship here. And what's, what's it all about? Jesus addresses all those things as a Samaritan. And he steps over those barriers into her world. Third barrier you'll see him stepping across is the fact that this person was bitter and sarcastic. This woman was bitter and sarcastic. We see it in the story because in verse 
9, when Jesus asked her for a drink of water, you know what her response is? <laughs> well, why do you ask me for a drink? Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Do you think she didn't know that Jesus already knew that? <laughs> She's heard it all of her life. You don't go over there. You don't marry those. You, you stay away from that person. You, you stay across. You stay on this side of the tracks. You stay out of that neighborhood. All of her life, she's been told, Jews can't hang around you and you around them. And they look down on you because of who you are and what your heritage, your DNA is. And he simply asked her for a drink of water. And she comes back very quickly with sense of sarcasm and bitterness. Why are you asking a, Jew, a, a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? Because Jews don't associate with Samaritans. When he says, if you knew who was asking a drink of water, you'd ask him for a drink. In verse 12, she says, or at verse 11, you don't even have a bucket. I love that. <laughs> That's her sarcasm and her bitterness. <laughs> You're going to give me a drink of water. You don't even have a bucket. And in verse 12, she goes on to say, and by the way, do you think you're better than Jacob who dug this well? Our father Jacob, do you really? Might give you an idea why she's been married at least five times. She wasn't, <laughs> she wasn't uh, too uh, quick to hold back what she thought at the moment. She put it in the sharpest way possible to get a dig in. Very true. Almost, not in every case, but in most cases where I've shared the gospel with somebody, at some point, I've had to walk through a shield and a wall of bitterness and sarcasm and cynicism at some point. And I've been the recipient of about every preacher joke you can think of. I've been the recipient of about every sharp dig somebody can give because of some bad experience they've had with somebody that they have known in their life who's been a Christian in some time past. And I've had to have an I've had to make a decision, make a choice. Do I fall into that trap? Do I But I've learned I just laugh. I just laugh. I was over in uh, Hamilton, Alabama, about four weeks ago at a competition coon hunt. <laughs> Didn't know a soul. Man standing outside, struck up conversation with him there for a moment. I'm hearing about everything under the sun. Language, stories, jokes, wisecracks. Then all of a sudden, one of them said, what do you do? I said, I'm a Baptist pastor. Immediately, one man reared back and said, you like fried chicken? <laughs> yep. Had some this week. You like fried chicken? I've learned just jump in there. Yeah. Just laugh and smile. You're going to find that. Jesus is modeling for us what we're to do. He didn't get sarcastic back. He just keeps having conversation. You'll, you'll find fourth, oh, Barry here, over, overcame here. This woman was immoral. She's immoral. We, we don't, it's amazing to me that as followers of Jesus, church going people, we don't want to be around immoral people. That amazes me. <laughs> we, 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 we try to stay away from immoral people which is the very life we've come from. And somebody had to love us. And there are times, even as followers of Jesus, we fall back over into immorality. And we have to love one another, and we have to love them and help bring them back, help them move forward in life. But we, we shun, we stay away from immoral people. We, we, somebody talks like we don't like to talk, we don't want to hear. I, I never tell somebody to stop cussing around me. I never do that. I, I, that's why I don't even tell them I'm a pastor unless they just ask. 
Our tolerance has to be built up. And it's not all about them saying a bad word or a curse word. I don't go around. Well, don't say that around me. Don't say that around me. I'm not that person. I don't think we should be that person. Jesus wasn't that person. He just got with them and hung out. And next thing you know, they're beginning to find out who he is. And they're saying, boy, I'm sorry I said that. Sorry I did that. God has a way of working through that, and we have opportunity to share truth and make sure our truth is focused on the right things. Our message is focused on the right things. This lady was immoral. said, you've been married five times. The man you're living with now is not your husband. And she immediately changed the subject. Doesn't want to deal with any of her stuff. Which leads me to point number three. We're challenged to use our story to change another person's story. In verse 10, it says that Jesus found a way to talk about spiritual things in the context of if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. That's his way of turning to spiritual things. In every conversation that really is going to have meaning at some point, we have to learn how to get to the subject of spiritual things. It's a hard transition. We can talk about a lot of stuff. We're good at talking about church. We're good at talking about uh, hobbies and all that kind of stuff. But to finally get to spiritual things, it's a hard one. I, I, know, the, I know the step. I th- after all these years, even if it's being a pastor, I feel the pressure of s- making that step to talk about spiritual things. But it's something we have to keep working toward. Why? Because Jesus did, and we're challenged to use our story to change another person's story, and we can't get there without that. I'll never forget and I've shared this story several times, but there's a guy that came to mind. He's pastoring a church today. And I was challenged to go to town when I was very, very young, about 18 or 19, and witness, and I didn't know how. And I remember taking some of those little printed gospel tracks. Uh, it's pink and gray. And it said, God's simple plan of salvation. And I remember going around to a few guys that I knew, and I used to be there with them, and partying with them, but now God called me to go there and share the gospel, and I remember handing those gospel tracts, and I just said, if you'll take this and read it and do what it says, it'll tell you how you can go to heaven, and that's all I knew how to say, and I handed those out. Many years passed, and I had a guy call, and he said, Todd, you you came to town one night and gave me this little piece of paper. He said, I I folded it up in my wallet, and I carried it in my wallet for 13 years. And he said, every time I'd get to drinking pretty heavy or get stoned, he said, I'd take it out and read it. I don't know why we get spiritual when we start getting drinking and get stoned, all right? But sometimes folks get a little spiritual, all right? But he said, every time I get about drunk, he said, I'd pull it out and read it. And one day, my daddy found out he had cancer. And my daddy said, I'm dying. If I die, I'm going to hell. And he said, I remember that little piece of paper, and I pulled it out, and I read it to my daddy. And it has a little prayer back there in the back to pray if you want to give your life to Jesus. And I told my daddy, Daddy, you ain't got to go to hell because this here says if you do what it says here, you can go to heaven. He said, I read it to my daddy. And he said, my daddy and I got under such conviction that night. It was around midnight or after. And he said, we went to a preacher's house that they'd known for a long time and woke him up. And said, Daddy and I need to get saved and give our life to Jesus. That man who carried it in his pocket for 13 years as pastor of a church today. Okay? My point is this. God gives us those unique moments. And we don't have a clue how how big they are. I don't have a clue. I I don't know the end of the story. I don't know the end of the story of the young man that I picked up and took home. I don't know the end of the story yet. I, I, I know how I want it to end. But the fact is, God has called me, he's called us to use our story to change another person's story. Jesus found a way to finally get the spiritual things, deal with the bottom line issues. Secondly, in verse 19 and 20, Jesus refused to be detoured by religious tradition and debate. When you're talking to somebody about faith issues, don't get caught up in religious tradition and debate. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get into modern day debates. Well, what kind of music y'all got over at your church? It doesn't matter. How y'all dressed at y'all's church? Doesn't matter. 
Y'all Baptist or Methodist? Doesn't matter. Don't get caught up in religious tradition. It's all about Jesus. Don't let people get you sidetracked. Number three, Jesus focused on truth. That's in verse 22 to 24. He said, ma'am, it's coming a time when it's going to be all about your heart. It's not about the building. It's not about the mountain. It's not about the city. It's all about your heart. God loves those is, is a God whose spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Keep your heart focused on him. And he said, that time has come. God loves those kind of worshipers. Keep focused on the truth. And finally, number four, as a part of using our story to change on the person's story, Jesus presented himself as the Messiah. At some point, Jesus has to be offered as the answer. Do you want to give your life to Jesus or do you not? Don't ever say, do you want to join our church or, or not? Or do you want to get baptized? No, it's an issue of the heart. Do you want to give your life to Jesus or do you not? It's a matter of acceptance or rejecting. Do you want to give your life to Jesus or not? He's the answer. I'm not. No church is. Jesus is the answer. If you look at the end of the story, it's in verse 39 to 42. It says they did ask him to stay for two more days. And he stayed and talked to them for two more days. And it says many, many Samaritans believed. Not only because of what the woman said. But now, because of what Jesus himself said. Let me ask you about your heads. Let me close your eyes for just a second. And I want you to reflect for a second about the fact that God's love knows no limits. God's love knows no limits. In some cases, these are people who we know. In some cases, people we don't. But he calls us to step into their world and use our stories to help change theirs. Because you see, as long as they're breathing, the last chapter of their story is not yet written. And it's like a novel, it's like a book, it's like a movie. It doesn't matter how tainted or dark or even filled with horror some chapters of a person's story may be if they're still breathing. The final chapter can be awesome and beautiful and can end with eternal life. If you want to give your life to Jesus right here in the room, or if you're watching online and you'd like to give your life to Jesus, don't know what brought you here today, don't know what made you tune in online, but it's not an accident. Pause, open up your heart and embrace Jesus. Call upon him with me right now. Pray this prayer, something like this. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. And today I invite you into my life to take over. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm all yours. Father, thank you for those who've given their hearts and lives to you. Rejoice and we celebrate God's goodness. And we celebrate eternal life and forgiveness in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Let's thank God for his word and welcome those in the family of God who've given their lives to him.